Welcome to Centennial Oral Histories, a series featuring former and current leaders of Duke University and Duke Health, sharing memories of their time at Duke and their hopes for Duke's future. Enjoy this discussion with Dr. Robert Califf, Commissioner of Food and Drugs, who served two separate terms. Dr. Califf is a Duke alumnus and renowned cardiologist who has held prominent leadership roles at Duke, including founding director of the Duke Clinical Research Institute. He is interviewed by Dr. Adrian Hernandez, Vice Dean and Executive Director of the Duke Clinical Research Institute. Hi, I'm Adrian Hernandez. I want to welcome you to Duke's Oral History. I'm here with Rob Califf, who spent a number of years at Duke, and uh, we're going to have a conversation about his time before Duke, during Duke, and actually what he's doing now and looking into the future. So Rob, let me start off uh, first uh, to just, you know, hear a little bit about uh, your, your background. Uh, you were born in South Carolina. Uh, what was that like and uh, or were there any influences uh, later in life? I think we're all heavily influenced by our youth. And in, in my case, my dad was an architect and he was teaching at Clemson when I was born. So at heart, I'm actually a Clemson guy. But when we were, when I was five, we moved uh, to Columbia, the capital of South Carolina, and he was very um, involved in designing buildings there. My mom was a school teacher, a very, um, I would say, intellectual, academically inclined family with dinner table conversations about um, politics and the direction of things. And of course, in that time, in the uh, sort of early to late 50s, it was sort of a stable time, as I think of it in American um, history, but then the 60s, a very tumultuous time, and particularly uh, shaping me was this uh, integration that was happening in the South. And I think a lot of people who are younger don't even realize how recent that was. I started out in totally segregated schools, and it was during my high school years that integration occurred. Wow. And uh, during that time, as you were in like high school, uh, were there things then that made you interested in pursuing uh, healthcare or research later, or how did that come about? I was in high school. I was mostly interested in basketball. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, ended up being captain of the state championship basketball team, uh, 4A South Carolina. Probably the pinnacle of my career in anything is the day after you won the state championship that night, you're on top of the world. Then you uh, recede back into normal life. It's kind of <laughs> deflating. But I also, um, I would say, had a very political period then. It turned out um, one of my friends through school all the way was Lee Outwater, who uh, yeah. was a famous Republican strategist. I was on the other side of the fence, so we were arguing even back in uh, junior high and high school um, but I really didn't have designs on medicine or healthcare. It, it is noticeable during that period of time, every year you took like a aptitude test for what you yeah. should do with your life. And it kept saying I should be a doctor. And I <laughs> mostly rejected that, um, that idea. It was only later, like junior year at, at Duke that I switched to a pre-med. Right. Well, interesting. I, I, I imagine some of the things that you were uh, dealing with in terms of political science actually came uh, together later in, in life. Now, going to your the basketball team, I imagine touring around the state playing other teams uh, during that time was probably pretty interesting, especially this era where there was integration and in playing different teams. There were, it was a fascinating time. There was a rule in South Carolina that the coach couldn't coach the team during the summer. And so as captain, I was actually sort of the proxy <laughs> coach. And one thing we did that um, I still have vivid memories of this. Uh, we, we had black players on our team, but they were still all black high schools. So we toured the all black high schools and scrimmaged them, which was a spectacle. The crowds were, it was a full packed uh, gymnasium every time with cheers that I had never heard growing up um, in the other schools that were a little bit disconcerting. and um, But that toughened us up quite a bit. And I think it was part of the story of how we ended up eventually winning the state championship. Well, wow, that's pretty awesome. And 
Uh, was there any uh, idea about uh, either playing at Duke or being recruited to Duke uh, for basketball? I had brief dreams of a college career, and I got some letters from, um, I would say, the you know lower ranked um, schools, not the not the one um, A schools. That also, uh, 1968, 69, um, you, you know, the assassinations uh, had occurred, the Vietnam right. War was going strong. And at that point, I really sort of lost the uh, intense focus on staying in shape and playing sports. Although I did play a lot of intramural <laughs> basketball at, at, uh, at Duke, and I, I switched to other interests at that point. So you showed up uh, to, to Duke in the late 1960s. Uh, uh, what led you to Duke? How did you choose Duke? Well, my older brother had come to Duke, and he <laughs> was a couple of years ahead of me. Um, and I, when I came to Duke, it um, literally was the furthest north I had been in my life. Um, you know, travel was different then, and I'd never really hardly been to North Carolina for anything other than up in the mountains occasionally when. Uh, we lived in Clemson, so it was actually a big journey for me to come to Duke and quite startling to walk into House L, the freshman dorm, with all these um, people from all over the country. It was an amazing um, experience. So the draw was really um, good academics and um, good sports and kind of like the way it is now when I look at, um, at, at undergrads. And uh, during that time, what, what was it like with your, your uh, fellow students? Well, um, it, it, I just remember it being intense, and we made a lot of friends. And in fact, you know, last year we had our 50th re Duke reunion, and although we had gone all over the country in different parts of the world doing very different things, it was as if we were back together again 50 years later, still able to relate to each other very easily and just, just having amazing conversations. But the other part of it was such a tumultuous time. Uh, in the history of the university, too, the year before had been the takeover of the Allen Building, the year before I came. Um, um, integration on the campus was a big deal. Wow. Not so much the students, as I remember it, but the um, workers in the hospital. It was a huge um, deal. But we didn't have classes most of the second semester because of the Vietnam War. And although I spent a lot of time in Washington now, my first visit to Washington was on a bus where I got tear gassed. Oh. And uh, you know, I take the red line in Washington now from my apartment building to the HHS offices next to the Capitol. And every time I go through DuPont Circle, I have a brief recollection <laughs> of running into the basement of a church at DuPont Circle, wow. having been tear gassed. But um, yeah, so the absence of classes was a remarkable um, period, I think, in the university's um, history. But things held together and became more regularized as uh, all that worked out. Now, it's uh, pretty amazing to go to the, uh, your 50th anniversary. And I imagine most people didn't go into medicine like you did. Uh, what were the types of careers that people went into? Gosh, we had city administrators, um, dentists, um, uh, people who wrote for newspapers or books, engineers. It was really um, an eclectic mix from all over the country and just about every profession that you can um, imagine. But we still had so many things in common and uh, easy to hang out together and right. chat. Now, you uh, eventually graduated with a major in psychology, which uh, is kind of interesting, you know, seeing the role that you have now, uh, dealing with a lot of people and a lot of different uh, organizations. How did you pick that? What was the... Well, I developed a deep interest in psychology, actually, back in high school, and was very focused on it. And I was going to be a clinical psychologist, and I ended up working in the South Carolina state prisons for two summers. Wow which was a tremendous experience. Um, but I sort of concluded after that first summer that um, maybe I wanted to do something that was a little bit more tangible. Um, it, w it was tough to be, uh, it, it turned out, some of my high school competitors were now inmates in the prison. Wow. And I got to see how difficult it was 
um, to exert change. So I've always had a lot of respect for people who work in the mental health field ever since then. But it, it sort of hit me that may, maybe for me, I should do something that had a little more concrete where you might see a problem and could help fix it. And medicine, ultimately cardiology, really uh, fits the bill. When you see someone in ventricular fibrillation and you apply some Duke power right. and defibrillate that person from being dead to being alive, that's pretty, uh, pretty concrete. So that was a big switch. I had taken no science courses until um, basically finishing my junior year. So after graduating from Duke, I took a year out and worked as an orderly because I had crammed all those science courses into my At Duke senior Hospital? year. No, I was over in Greensboro, got okay. married. Lydia was uh, in a school at UNC Greensboro. And um, it was that was an amazing experience working at Getting that Getting married level. or? Well, <laughs> uh, the whole thing of marriage has been amazing. <laughs> um, you know, 1973 to 2024, we've had a long yeah. and great marriage. But serving the needs of people at a basal, basal level uh, is humbling. Uh, it, it also, I think, teaches you a lot of things that I worry a lot of medical students never think about until there may be too far along. Yeah, I, you know, we'll talk about that theme about caring about the front line. Uh, that sounds like a, uh, you had some of that direct experience that uh, continued on. So you uh, went on and decided to go in medicine. You chose uh, Duke Med School. Uh, was that an easy choice? How did you get there? Well, I, it actually was surprising. I thought I was saying goodbye to, um, to Durham. and. You know, you mentioned Washington. This came up last night. I, I can't quite get over it, but one of the fellow, fellow awardees with me at the at the Founders Day celebration last night um, is a behavior animal behavior expert who had mentioned that um, there was a goat colony that Duke kept up for people to study animal behavior. And I actually did that for a semester. Really? Studying the hierarchical behavior of goats. <laughs> it turns out that has been a fabulous... Uh, background for dealing with Washington politicians, very similar. Um, Behavioral economics, quite interesting. It's, there's a hierarchy and people, uh, the goats know exactly which goat gets uh, uh, dominance over the others in different situations. And I think the same thing, pretty obvious uh, in, uh, in, in politics that it works that way. Right. And so uh, when you uh, uh, went to Duke Med School, like, what was that like? Uh, yeah, so that, it, it actually was, I was not expecting to come back to Durham, and I'd actually paid uh, the down payment at Tulane wow. um, when the Duke admission came through, and it was a hard decision, but um, Tulane would have been great, but it ultimately, I think, worked out um, really well for us. You know, we didn't have a lot of money. We, uh, we had a very uh, meager subsistence, and... and uh, but Lydia was working as a nurse at Duke Hospital. She had gotten her nursing degree at UNC Greensboro, and it was just a fabulous um, culture and experience. But you know, my first day, we had went to a medical grand rounds and got to see Dr. Eugene Stead in oh, action. Wow. And um, a neurologist was presenting a case, and halfway through it, Dr. Stead got up and basically told the neurologist, you're wrong. <laughs> and uh, they got into an argument, and. It was quite an introduction to, um, you know, the um, complexity and personalities in medicine. But what a bond that first year at Duke where, you know, early on Duke took this position to compress the basic sciences into one year, very intense. And so you talk about friends and relationships, that first year class was uh, remarkable and still something I think about a, a lot. And then that second year, you're out there uh, taking care of patients. Um, an amazing experience in the old Duke Hospital. Um, learned so much. So when did you get exposed to research? Uh, when did you, uh, you said some in undergraduate uh, time, but you know, I guess medical research, when was that? Yeah, I would say most of my undergraduate research was, you know, some observations and a little bit of writing, not heavy duty research, but um, 
I um, needed to work part time while I was a medical student um, to help pay the bills, and I ended up working with a uh, this new thing called a computerized database that had been <laughs> developed actually by Dr. Said, and it was amazing to me because at the time all medical communication, as you know, was handwritten, um, including the orders for the patients, the clinic notes, and um, essentially everything was handwritten. And so doctors got to be well known basically by having good memories or being able to concoct stories about their memories that were believable to <laughs> other people. But it turned out when you had, you know, computerized data, that, you know, very simple things that we take for granted today, you could see that a lot of the recollections and beliefs of the doctors were just flat out wrong. Wow. And um, the ability to aggregate information over time, it was just, Dr. Stead was way ahead of his time, as he was in some other things in this regard. He not only realized that um, capturing information in computers was important, but the longitudinal nature of um, the uh, disease and outcomes, his, his rule that he put into place was once you got entered into the database, you were followed for life. And um, there's so many cognitive tricks that we know about now, but people still fall prey to them, like um, how someone looks initially after a treatment is instantiated into your mind is that's right. how the treatment works. But there are many treatments that either have no effect early or even a detrimental effect early that show later benefit. And of course, at the time, coronary bypass surgery was brand new. So he would take me to um, conferences because every case was reviewed and uh, the cardiologists and surgeons would look at the old CINE film. This is when you were a med student? Yeah, yeah when I was a med student. And he would say, they're going to say X, Y, and Z, but here's the computerized data and they're making the wrong decision. Really? And what year was this? This is uh, Four years. 1976, 77. Wow, okay. And so to this day, um, in my job at FDA, I still see so many situations where common sense beliefs by doctors and patients and other practitioners don't fit with what the data actually show and it's a lesson I think we have to learn over and over. Now give us a sense of what you mean by computer like it, it's not just a, <laughs> we, a laptop or something that you... No we had were, a thing called a PDP-11 it took up an entire room in Duke South and you would um, enter your code um, and for most things we did you would come back the next day it wouldn't run all night and then you would get your answer to the question. This, of course, was a more genteel time of academic medicine. I was a student and I was working with all the cardiology fellows and they had a team. It was, it was a unique thing at the time, but a multidisciplinary team. One of the original biostatisticians, Carrie Lee, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the original um, engineers who worked with software, Frank Stormer, and one who sort of bridged it called Ed Hammond. Ed, of course, is still yeah. around. And, the team um, built new things and um, broke a lot of ground. And this was a tremendous education for me because I went with them to some NIH site visits where um, their pioneering work was not very well received. It was considered um, avant-garde and upstart. And in fact, one of the most important things Dr. Stead did, which you could never do now, is he took a grant uh, that was given for physiologic monitoring. Again, hard for young people to believe, but we were just beginning to put um, rhythm monitors on people in intensive right. care units. But he took the money and built this database to measure patient outcome over time. And uh, they did reverse site visits at the time. <laughs> he totally shocked the site <laughs> visitors. You gave me the money for this, but here's what I did with it. They were not too happy, but at the time you could get away with that. And it the kind of creativity that was shown in this group, just, I was sold. I mean, there was no way I was going what a, back. What a special time. I mean, almost 50 years ago to think about something now we take for granted, uh, computerized yeah. medicine. There's another thing that happened is that, um, you know, the death rates at the time, coronary care units were filled with 50 to 60 year old people, mostly men who were cigarette 
smokers and they died at alarming rates. And the Holter Monitor had just come out, speaking of monitoring. So my project as a fellow, as a student, was to put Holter Monitors on people. I only needed 386 people to, and then follow them while I was still a student, like for a year. So many people died that we had very meaningful outcome data. And the question was, could we predict uh, sudden death? And it turned out, you know, the hypothesis was that the arrhythmia shown on this new Holter monitor would be the best predictor. And I uh, put the data together and brought it to Kerry Lee, um, the statistician. He ran some regression analyses, and lo and behold, it wasn't the cardiac dysrhythmias, it was the underlying left ventricular function. Wow, wow. So, um, we wrote that up, and it was not a popular message. It was not well received. People didn't believe it. And I went on out to UCSF for my internship, but our abstract was accepted to the American Heart Association in Miami. And it was one of those things where I just barely got a couple of days off, got on the plane, and at the time we had the slide carousels with the <laughs> heart slides, ran into the Fountain Blue Hotel, gave my talk, and the commentators just basically said I was stupid and I had gotten it wrong. Oh my. But the conclusion of our study was that treating sudden death was gonna be a matter of identifying people with impaired left ventricular function. Guess what, we were right. <laughs> so what's the criteria now for a defibrillator? It's LV yeah. function. So that's a really interesting and so it just shows the, the power of data and uh, making right. sure to eliminate um, as much as possible uh, biases. So you spent time in uh, the Bay Area, you eventually get back there. Um, what was that like uh, during residency at UCSF? I, uh, I loved it. Um, there was an event that happened. Our first child was born um, just as I was finishing that fourth year of medical school. And um, turned out she had really serious congenital heart disease. But um, it was actually not diagnosed at Duke, even though she was not thriving. So we traveled across the country not knowing why her baby was not growing at a normal rate. And um, for people that have been to San Francisco in the summer, you'll relate to this story. Mm -hmm. But on a, you know, arrived in June, started the internship. I took uh, Sharon out on the porch on a July day when the fog was in. It was like 45 degrees <laughs> in July. And she turned blue um, right in my arms. And uh, she ended up having a, a huge operation while I was an intern. So we would make rounds on all the adult patients, I was a medical intern. Then we'd go around on my daughter in the ICU. That was a month of my internship. But, you know, it's amazing that people everywhere are pretty much the same. They took really good care of us. We made friends for life. Of, uh, and I know you spent time there too, so yeah. you have a sense of the community there. I fell in love with San Francisco. It, it actually turns out San Francisco and Durham, in my opinion, have a lot in common. They're very heterogeneous um, towns, and the people in San Francisco tend to be really friendly and easy to talk with, um, much like the people uh, in Durham. It doesn't matter what your right. background or skin color is, you're pretty much uh, getting along with everybody. And I find Durham to be similar and increasingly so as a um, melting pot um, community. Yeah, and I think also like the, the sense of uh, uh, collaboration you know, at the university, you know, same thing in both places. Now, uh, you came back to uh, Duke for cardiology. I uh, assume there are some things here that you still wanted to continue uh, to pursue uh, when you came back for cardiology. First. Yeah, that was actually a really hard decision. You know, those are the days of short tracking in medicine. So I'd done, you know, two years. Um, you, you know, I had conversations about being a chief resident, which is a very prestigious thing at a place like UCSF. But um, I was addicted to the uh, computer. Um, and, you know, now you would never believe it, but the Bay Area was way behind in computing. Duke was way ahead. <laughs> and so, uh, in addition, uh, Sharon, you know, was still, you know, we'd been through a, quite a traumatic thing and we wanted to be closer to family. So we came back and I went right to work as um, a fellow and had a fabulous time. 
And then uh, you came on the faculty um, shortly <laughs> after that. Uh, what was that time like? Uh, uh, well, did you have like eighty percent protected time uh, <laughs> for research, and you know, occasionally see patients. Once again, um, two years into the fellowship, um, the coronary care unit director Eric Kahn went into practice in Chattanooga, and Joe Greenfield, the chief, called me in. He said. I think we need you to uh, be the attending on the coronary care unit while you finish your fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow that was um, managed, and that's actually what I did. Um, I was on call for both Duke and uh, what's now Durham Regional Hospital. It was Watts Hospital, or Durham County, at the time. So I was on call 12 out of 14 nights. And that first year when I took over the coronary... 12 out of 14 yeah. nights. Okay. The first year was the of uh, that time was uh, when the first coronary angiograms were done, showing that what caused heart attacks was a blood clot. Hard to believe that I was taught as a medical student that blood, blood clots did not cause heart attacks. <laughs> uh, it took some adventurous cardiologists doing acute angiograms to see that. But then the race was on. What do you do about it now? You know, the leading cause of death. People, you know, I, would, I was losing four or five people a day on the Duke coronary care unit because we essentially had no treatment. Um, and dissolving the blood clot was something that we knew could be done. So that set off a race. So the 12 out of 14 nights was literally very often coming in, like most nights, coming in to see a critically ill person to put them on a protocol and very few other institutions were doing this kind of work, so it was very high, uh, high stakes and high profile. And so that was some of your first clinical trials? Uh... Right. It, um, what happened was uh, Eric Topol, who's known by a lot of people now, was one of my interns at UCSF, and he went to Hopkins to do his cardiology fellowship. And, uh, we essentially formed a little study group of former UCSF residents and interns. Dean Kiriakis, who's now in Cincinnati, uh, Barry George and Dick Candela in uh, Columbus. Um, and we would literally um, treat an acute patient, um, you know, do our work in the cath lab, and then we would get on a plane and look at the films together and try to figure out what to do next. But then what happened was this was such a big problem and so high profile, the uh, pharmaceutical industry realized that this was an opportunity to um, save lives. And so there were an endless series of efforts to develop effective drugs and devices to treat this problem. So because we had the computers at Duke, we became the coordinating center for these efforts. We had the data. <laughs> So it sounds like that was also the kind of uh, continue on kind of the next phase of what was called the, the Duke Data Bank. Uh, so what did you transition from just watching people through the data bank to actually doing randomized trials? Well, you know, I want to say again, I give a lot of credit to Dr. Stead and the many people around him, Bob Rosati, Galen Wagner um, were part of the group. Frank Harrell came on as a junior statistician who's been a luminary of um, all this as far as I'm concerned. But what Dr. Stead and team realized was that the best way to practice medicine was to um, use the human skills, but depend heavily on the computer to support the human skills, to give you the information that you needed to work with patients to make the best decisions. That led to a whole analytical scheme of observing, recording information, analyzing the data, what we now call um, observational treatment comparisons. But it quickly became apparent to me that um, it was very hard to get the right answer because one of them, one issue is the time dimension that we talked about. Right. What looks better early on might look not so good later on and vice versa. But you also, um, the reasons why people got one treatment or another were based on reasons um, that could not be quantified. And so as we started to do some randomized trials, I became to realize that if you want to get the right answer about therapies, and it's not a huge effect um, that's easily apparent early on, you're much better to randomize and get the right 
um, answer. And we could easily demonstrate, because I, I would say a fellow every day came in with some analysis. Most of them, you know, most, half of them were wrong, but you couldn't tell which half. Um, and there was no fancy way to figure it out. Uh, randomization um, was a much, uh, much better approach. But that evolved in um, this ability to see patients and collect data and do the clinical trials, I think um, is a part of medicine that unfortunately is under assault right now. Right. It never really caught on um, because most people didn't have the sort of institutional support that we had um, as all this started up. So it sounds like you were really combining what you were seeing clinically with actually uh, generating new data about what to do with your colleagues and also uh, doing the clinical trials so that would have a more definitive answers. Yeah, I mean, what, what an amazing thing that one week you can be treating a group of people with a problem. You don't really know what the right treatment is. The next week you've gotten the answer in a randomized trial and you go to talk to that person in the family. You say, we're going to do this because we did a trial and it's a better treatment. You have a much better chance of being alive or being um, functional. And to be able to do that in real time, it's something that given where we are with technology today and given the 8 billion people in the world, this is the way we should be doing everything, but we're a long ways from it. It's, in fact, I think one of the first few papers I wrote was predicting that we'd be doing this within five years. That was 1980. <laughs> it didn't. And, and of course, as you well know, Adrian, this is not a techno technology problem now. It's really a cultural problem that it's hard for us to admit we don't know the right treatment. Yeah. And very often we don't. And it's hard for people to work together to agree on how to answer a question. Everybody wants to have their own. Um, there's a tendency for people to want to have their own predominance over the domain that they're um, working in. Yeah, it sounds like you know some of the themes around uh, clinical science, but there's actually this social science and psychological science in terms of uh, different biases that come together. Yeah, it's all, all involved. And people forget that in those early days of treating acute heart attacks, I mean, we came up with some amazing, very, you know, your risk of being dead now is half of what it was then. But most things we tried didn't work. And what a humbling experience that is when you have something you were sure was going to work. It worked in preclinical and animal models. And now you do the trial in human beings and it doesn't work. Or right. it, in, in some cases even caused harm that was not predictable until you did the study. Very humbling, but an experience I think more people should have so that they're driven to want to get the answers as opposed to presuming they know the answers already. So when did you transition from doing the small trials with your friends and colleagues to something bigger? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's a small world. And um, Ralph Snyderman had been a rheumatologist at Duke, and he had been recruited away to Genentech, the first really major biotech company in the world, out in San Francisco, started by many of our mutual yeah. professors at UCSF. Um, and we were doing these small heart attack trials and there was a new drug called tissue plasminogen activator that G Genentech developed. Um, and the Europeans did, the Europeans were doing large trials at the time. They did a mega trial and lo and behold, the very inexpensive drug streptokinase was just as good <laughs> as the highly expensive American biotech drug, uh, TPA as it was called. But they had dosed the TPA in a way we knew was suboptimal. And so there needed to be another large trial to answer the question. Um, as it turned out, um, there had never been a US-based mega trial, as we call it. But Genentech was under investigation for bad marketing practices. And so they decided they needed to outsource the big mega trial to an academic center. And um, we had gained the trust of both the FDA and the industry in our previous work. And so uh, they came to us and said, would you coordinate this trial? I still remember we did a little sample size calculation. It came out 30,000 people would be needed. The biggest trial we'd ever done before then was about 
700 <laughs> patients, and we had never worked internationally. So um, then some other things happened. We needed to add a fourth arm, and that increased the sample size to 40,000. But um, Did anyone say that you all were completely crazy? Most of the people that I was working with at Duke said we were completely <laughs> crazy. Um, and uh, there were many um, stressful and tearful moments with, uh, just because of the, this was heavily watched by the world because it really was a, um, you know, for people that follow the way the press works, it was a clash of the new biotech versus the old way of uh, doing things. So we were constantly under scrutiny, but um, the trial got done in record time. And um, Ralph um, had come back to Duke which created a conflict, interestingly enough, <laughs> much like many of the things that you deal with now. But Bill Donilon, who was Ralph's right-hand person and ran a lot of the operations, did a phenomenal job of brokering you know, the kind of contract that now you take for granted. But it was a very new thing in um, academia to work this way with, uh, with industry. And we got the trial done ahead of time, um, got... Um, an answer, and it was, you know, a small difference. One in a hundred patients saved with the new drug compared to the old. But um, that created an entire infrastructure for doing clinical trials that we then um, used over and over. And was that the start of uh, the DCRI? Well, once we had done that in a few other trials, it struck me that um, this was a method that needed to be used throughout medicine. And again, I had a lot of support from the institution and the thought that we should create um, an entity that evolved from the database with a few clinical trials to an institutional entity that could be used by any uh, specialty or primary care within the institution. And that was what led to the DCRI. Um, it turned out that um, McKinsey um, was being run by people who were Duke grads, so we got a special <laughs> deal for getting the world's premier consulting firm to come in and help us um, put the um, structure together because there's nothing that really existed like it um, at the time. And um, as I like to say, we taught, I think it was 10 young McKinsey start, <laughs> startup people um, all about clinical trials. They all went on and did great things, of course, in the rest of their consulting business. And we had an entity that could serve uh, the faculty at Duke and their desire to get clinical studies done. So you founded uh, Duke Clinical Research Institute in 96 and uh, had a 10-year ten ten year run at it. What were kind of key things that happened during that time? Well. We learned a lot about the methodology of clinical trials. We answered a lot of questions that um, made a difference. Um, uh, we changed the way a lot of things were done in terms of people working together. But it also created a lot of interesting, complex situations within the institution and with the outside world. People um, imitated us or tried to take what we had done and do it better, so competition evolved. But um, the very issue of being able to answer questions quickly was disruptive to people who were comfortable in the old way of saying, I'm the professor, so I know the answer. And um, it, it, that led to some issues. We also had some difficulty getting acceptance that clinical research was an academic um, pursuit. Um, academia was dominated by the basic sciences at a place like Duke, and um, it was just not seen as being of the same stature as right. um, discovery academic research. Now, you could have uh, obviously chosen to build the DCRI outside of Duke. Um, there are many examples of that uh, in the industry. Uh, you chose not to do that. Uh, what was the reason for that? Well. It goes back to what I said before. I was completely um, stimulated by the view that the best way to do 
um, healthcare research was to do it in the practice of medicine. That is, um, I never thought of clinical trials or observational studies as some separate thing called research. It was really just a way of learning about how to get it right when you treated patients. Um, and I was, at that point, very focused on clinical care of people who were sick. Um, that was enough at the time to focus on. There was plenty right. to work on. So it really never crossed my mind until we ran into some obstacles and difficulties with the university that I should even think about um, taking it outside. Now, Destroy isn't just about cardiology, or wasn't it, even though you're a cardiologist, was that uh, something intentional uh, to be around different areas? Right. It, it, it seemed to me that the methods we had developed were not just applicable to cardiology. They could help any specialty or any problem. Um, and um, some people gravitated to it right away and thought it was great, and some people found it to be disruptive to the sort of mantra that I'm the professor, I know the answer, <laughs> why, why are you even asking the question? And from my perspective, you never really know until you've really addressed the question in an empirical way whether you're right about your suppositions. So there was a variety of uptake of it, but it, I always thought it would be best for every part of the medical center to be answering questions about practice. Right. Now, you had other roles at, at, at Duke. Uh, you were also um, uh, founder of uh, the Duke Translational uh, Medicine Institute and also various uh, vice chancellor roles over time. Uh, uh, what were the key things there that uh, you focused on? Well, first let me say that um, there were many obstacles in getting clinical research accepted as a valid academic activity, but uh, the battles were won, um, and you know I think it's a characteristic of Duke as an institution that um, you're put to the test, but it's such an optimistic place that um, new things come along, they get accepted, and they move along. So you did, uh, you led the DCRI for for ten years, and uh, then you went on to do some other roles, including uh, uh, founding the the Duke Translational Medicine Institute. What was the background for that, and what was going on nationally? Well, there, been a, there was a lot of turmoil at the NIH as, as, our, as the DCRI evolved and other institutions were moving into hardcore clinical research as a discipline. There was a view of a lot of people that the NIH was not funding enough clinical research, that it was too heavily, purely focused on discovery research. And there's a lot of concern that these discoveries are not being translated into um, interventions that help health, help human health. And so um, we um, spent a lot of time at the NIH and it developed a program um, called the Clinical Translational Science Awards. I was very involved in that. And they were big institutional awards meant to build the infrastructure to help institutions go from the scientists in the lab with a discovery to the steps that need to be taken to cross the chasm, as it's called, between early science and a product that could be used like a drug or a device. And so we got one of the first grants, the first batch of grants um, to do that, and that led to um, the Translational Medicine Institute. And it was an amazing experience because it brought in a big tranche of money to take a lot of people who either had not thought about translating their findings into uh, useful health technologies, or people who had wanted to do it but just didn't have a way right. of making it happen. So those, sort of like the upstart of the DCRI, the, this was a very exciting time of new things getting done. And along uh, the years, you were an advisor to the NIH, the FDA, uh, other agencies, uh, you eventually uh, went to the FDA. Uh, so what, what attracted you to go there? Well, it actually goes back to the big GUSO trial, that um, the first mega trial that we did. We upset a lot of people because we were using methods that hadn't been used before. And um, 
some very forward-thinking people at FDA encouraged us to do it because they wanted to get the answer to the question. And I worked very closely with them. But it upset so many people that we went through a two-year congressional investigation. <laughs> people accused us of, I don't know, making up data or something. And so our data ended up being analyzed by multiple government agencies and outside consultants. Everybody got the same answer. The trial uh, carried the day. But in the process of doing that, I became very good friends with people at FDA and came to understand deeply the role the FDA plays in medicine and healthcare. And because of that, um, it turned out I was interviewed twice for a commissioner. Um, uh, and, you know, I didn't get the job. But um, finally the time came uh, when Peggy Hamburg, who was the commissioner uh, under Obama, came and visited me and said, you know, um, I'm getting ready to step down. Maybe you should be the next, next commissioner, but there's a problem the president has to ask you, but we have this job to be deputy commissioner. At that point, I felt like I'd pretty much done um, what I, you know, was born to do at Duke. Um, turned out that wasn't true, uh, <laughs> but, um, and I had people like you and Bob Harrington, Eric Peterson, Leslie Curtis, leaders who were doing a great job with what I felt like I had started. So I went to FDA as a civil servant, which was an amazing experience. And I still, you know, um, while I was opposed to the Vietnam War, I had deep respect for my friends uh, who volunteered or were drafted. Turned out I, my draft number was over 300. So I, I was in the draft. Um, I was just not called in the draft. So I'd never done public service. And what an amazing experience to have such a clarity of mission about the public health. Um, after a few months of doing that, people were knocking on my door saying, when is the president going to ask you to be commissioner? And uh, finally, I was asked to brief President Obama with um, 12 hours notice on the error rates of gene sequencing. <laughs> which in 2016 was a relatively new yeah. topic and um, went to the Roosevelt Room right there next to the Oval Office, did my briefing. The room was full of people like Francis Collins, who was the NIH director. And um, I was amazed because uh, President Obama always read everything the night before. We didn't even talk about the slides that I had prepared. He was right into the next level of questions and very interested in the mathematics involved in this. And so as I was walking out, they said, you've been asked to come to the Oval Office the next day and um, met with President Obama. Adrian, you've heard this story, but we had 30 minutes of a one-on-one. -on -one. The first 15 minutes were UNC versus Duke basketball. Oh. He's an enormous UNC fan and still One lives. of his faults. Yeah. He had this spat with Reggie Love, who was his assistant. Uh, we eventually got over that and he <laughs> asked me to be um, commissioner. So that was how that happened. But I still go back those, those months as a civil servant. I learned a lot about how the government works and what the value is of civil servants. And was there anything that uh, prepared you for your time at the FDA from, from Duke or your history? I, I feel like um, I've been so lucky because most of the things I've done have been an evolution, but not because I planned it out that way. I just had all those interactions with FDA because of what I was doing um, at Duke. And being an administrator in the academic center is very similar to FDA. At a, at a place like Duke, you have um, departments. They are the old traditional stovepipe units. Yeah. They have rivalries. <laughs> um, you have centers and institutes that cut across, and you have deans. Um, there's always a rivalry between the dean and the departments who's really in charge. At the FDA, you have centers that are commodity-based, drugs, devices, biologics, food, um, cosmetics, um, animals, the Center for Veterinary Medicine. And the commissioner is more like a dean than anything else. Of course, there's a huge role in public right. facing in Congress facing, but the internal workings at the FDA have all the same dynamics of getting along across people who have a 
like there's one Duke, that's one thing, there's one FDA, but there are also components that have their own interests that have to be brought together. And uh, during your time at uh, FDA, you spent two uh, tours at FDA during your second tour uh, here. What's been the most challenging uh, problems that you faced? I'd say, um, you know, the first time through, I didn't feel like they were terribly ch challenging problems. It became challenging when the election had an unexpected result and I was out of a job much <laughs> more quickly than I expected. Um, but when I came back the second time, of course, having been through it once, I had a cl pretty clear focus on what I wanted to accomplish. But one characteristic of being FDA commissioner is you get a new crisis every day, often something you didn't anticipate. So in this case, um, the uh, big infant formula recall when the Abbott plant was unsanitary happened the day I was confirmed. So immediately I was thrown into really dealing with food more than anything else. And, you know, I don't know if things happened for a reason, but it turned out uh, the food part of the FDA needed a lot of help. And we're currently undergoing the biggest reorganization in the history of the FDA. It actually starts in um, uh, operation the 1st of October. That's been major, and there's so many things about food. But it gets back to what I see as one of the two or three central overarching challenges. We're in a country uh, that's far and away the wealthiest, with the, the most highly educated people in the world. We have the worst life expectancy of any high income country now, and it's getting worse, not better, relative to other countries. So when I look at it from the FDA perch, we are also creating the innovations for the rest of the world, far and away, everywhere I go. Everyone agrees the U.S. is the source of creativity and new technologies and products. But there's something wrong with what happens after that. So we get back to the old translation thing. And some of it is very rudimentary, fundamental stuff like what do we eat? Why do we have this tremendous advertising machine advertising unhealthy foods um, when we know that nutrition should be different? Um, tobaccos. Combustible tobacco is still the leading remediable cause of death in the United States. Most people don't realize that because they consider that we... Right. Because most people like us who are in the rarefied university type environment, nobody uses combustible tobacco here, but we've got 30 million Americans still using it. And we're the only high income country without graphic warnings on the cigarette package to remind people um, not to do it. So. This is problem number one, and sort of related is the misinformation avalanche, which is um, overwhelming and getting worse and very hard to deal with. And of course, the other thing that happened when I, I came back in the middle of the peak of the pandemic, and um, that was extremely challenging because the FDA had to do its pandemic work and all of its other work with the same people in a virtual um, environment. So big challenges, but um, also interesting. So uh, your, your tour is not over yet. Uh, what's, uh, what are your proudest moments at the FDA so far? Uh, to me, the most important thing about the FDA is the um, value of civil service. So I'm very proud of the people that work there. You come to work at the FDA knowing you're going to get um, criticized in everything that you do. Um, there's an analogy to working in an intensive care unit. You have to make decisions, even if you have imperfect information. You can't say, well, I'm sorry you're in cardiac arrest. Come back next year when I have an answer as to what to do. Right. You've got to do what um, you think is best. And very often, there are timelines on things where FDA has to make a decision with imperfect information, almost every decision because we're regulating 20% of the economy. So the difference is you're dealing with families in the intensive care unit and sometimes hypercritical right. interns and residents, et cetera. Yeah. But, uh, here you're dealing with the national press, the Congress, and the second guessing is extreme. But through it all, uh, the civil servants have a mission. Um, it's a tremendous workforce. I'd highly recommend that people read Michael Lewis's um, 
but the fifth dimension, but especially pertinent to I've the- read it, and I understand what you mean. Yeah. So it's all about civil servants. He's doing a series in the Washington Post right now where he's picking a civil servant every week, and they do the whole people you've never heard of that yeah. do things that make a project huge managers. Difference. Yeah. But he also has a podcast called Refuse Suck, <laughs> which I highly recommend. It's very pertinent to FDA, <laughs> and it's about uh, what's happened in our society where, um, and I think the FDA largely is a referee because. Contrary to what a lot of people think, the FDA doesn't write the rules. The rules are written by Congress. They're called laws. And so, but then there's a rule book, which the FDA contributes to, that's agreed to, and then um, whether products get on the market and what happens is adjudicated according uh, to the rule book. There's something that's happened in our society. We're criticizing the referees as a national pastime. What's also interesting about it, as he points out, it used to be that the worst players criticized the referees. <laughs> now, if you think about it, it's the highest paid, um, most talented players who yeah. are most likely to criticize the referees. And I think very much in the power struggle of corporations and products, um, we get a lot of powerful criticism. But it comes back to the FDA employees put their heads down and do their work. and. Um, it's really an amazing thing to see. Now we're here celebrating uh, Duke's 100 years. Uh, so what do you think Duke needs to be doing to prepare for the next 100 years? Well, um, you know, the Centennial Founder Celebration was last night and I had a lot of chance to reflect on it and heard an amazing um, session, which I hope is gonna be all over YouTube from the three former living uh, presidents, um, Nan Cohane, uh, Dick Broadhead, and of course, Vince Price, um, and um, questions by Judy Woodruff. So they were not softball <laughs> questions. But I think the most important thing for Duke to do is actually look at its history. Um, I like, it, you know, of course, I have a particular view on this being from South Carolina, coming the furthest north I'd ever been to come to Duke. I, you know, this sort of thing ringing in my head is Duke is where the history of the South meets the changing current conditions. And that was definitely true in the late 1960s. Um, I think it's, if you look at society today, we have this terrible problem with our health. We have a fundamental disrespect for our loss of confidence in institutions like universities. They talked last night about the bubble if you go to a place like Duke and then you go and live in San Francisco or Washington or New York or anywhere you live, you live in a suburb with people who went to similar institutions, it, it leads to a division in our society which is very detrimental. And you know, we used to call him Uncle Terry, but if you look at Terry Sanford, I think everyone agreed. Like here's a person, he wasn't perfect, but he had a sense of what the average person in North Carolina was going through and he had a had a, a view that universities were critical, but he did it in a way that actually brought people in and didn't um, alienate them. I'd also say we had university leaders over time who had courage, courage to tackle um, racism, courage to tackle um, uh, sex and gender inequality. Um, Nan Cohen made the point that the women's campus was actually thought of as kind of a weird thing, but it was a great asset because women at Duke had status from the right. um, beginning. But she put into place same-sex marriage um, at a chapel in the year when the Methodist Church made a pronouncement it was not going to support same-sex marriage. And that took courage. On the medical side, we had um, people who started um, helicopter programs that were thought to be financial losers to save uh, lives. We have Bart Haynes who tackled HIV when you weren't allowed to use the word AIDS at Duke because um, it brought up these concerns about um, homosexuality or gay behavior as it was called at the time. Um, Bart took it on and did amazing uh, research that um, has, has of course spawned this vaccine institute. Um, I told the story last night, one of my freshmen dorm mates um, used to say, if you come to Duke, you get free tickets. <laughs> and uh, he was from Hickory, North Carolina. 
we're a wealthy institution, relatively yeah. speaking, and we get free tickets. And our leaders historically have used those free tickets to do things that you couldn't do at other places. There's another option, which is to say, we got a lot of money, let's rest on our laurels, let's protect ourselves from the risk of doing new things. This is not a time to be complacent. We are in serious trouble in this society, both on the health side and on the side of pursuit of truth. There's also a great quote in the video that's being used for the centennial from Few, the um, original president, that basically says something to the effect of, I want to create a shining place which pursues truth uh, for the good of our fellow human being. So uh, here we are in a world of misinformation. What, what a great time to, um, for leaders to step forward, even if they're going to get criticized and make a difference. So it sounds like a key word here is, through, is courage. Uh, courage to do the right thing, uh, courage to do something different, courage to actually lean in, uh, have some, some views of what other, how other people are living. That's right, and I, you know, I keep going back to Dr. Seb because he was a, such a mentor to me, and you know, he was an unusual person. People thought of him as unusual. <laughs> um, he came up with a lot of ideas that didn't work out. That, um, but who else would have thought of a physician's assistant program? And here we are, trying to get a primary care appointment today. He saw that coming yeah. and um, didn't completely get the job done, but it, it certainly built a, a, a bridge, which is a I think a segue um, in, into the future and building, uh, uh, using computers in medicine when other people were afraid of computers um, at the time. So, yeah, I think courage and um, I think part of the American way is you try new things. Some of them don't work. That's okay. Take the criticism and keep going. And uh, final one, uh, last question. Uh, Bob Lefkowitz, a uh, Nobel laureate at uh, Duke, often uh, comments it's uh, better to be lucky than not. Did you feel like you've been lucky over the years? I have definitely been lucky. Um, nothing that happened in my career was really um, sort of, I thought about it a long time, planned it all out over the course of years. Um, Things just happen. But I, I do think the old motto is um, luck is where preparation meets inspiration. <laughs> and um, I think there's a lot um, to that. And I, you know, hopefully, even as I'm turning 73 this year, I've still got an open mind. Um, there's some amazing things happening. Of course, in my job at FDA, I get to see the 20% of the economy, all the new things. Yeah that people are thinking about um, um, and doing. So I've definitely um, been lucky and uh, been lucky to be in an institution that has its warts. It's not perfect, but um, it, it has over the years supported people who did new things that were, were uh, different and that other people weren't yet trying. Great. Well, Rob, uh, thanks for spending time with us, uh, sharing your, your past history um, before Duke, at Duke, and uh, now at FDA. Thanks, Andrew, and good to be with you.